Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 82. The first thing I want to do today is to welcome the new patrons who have joined me on Patreon recently. Thank you so much for joining, and thank you to all those who've been supporting Journaling with Nature podcast in this way. Your support is the reason why I'm able to continue with this project and create the podcast every week. If you are a long-term listener and you find value in these conversations about nature and curiosity, please consider joining us on Patreon. You can pledge a small monthly donation which will be used to cover the cost of creating the podcast and help make this project sustainable into the future. So I love hosting the Journaling with Nature podcast because I get the chance to meet new people, chat about these topics that we all love, nature, nature journaling and creativity, and sometimes I'm lucky enough to get the chance to interview a guest who is also a friend. Today's guest, Elisa Singh, is a dear internet friend who I've never met face to face, but who I've shared some very deep discussions with through this technology that's now part of our lives. I was so happy to have the chance to speak with Elisa about her story. And as you know, I love talking about the heart and feelings and the complexity of being human. And we dive deeply into all these topics during our conversation today. Let's listen. I am so glad you're here with me, Elisa. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. (laughs) So the very first thing I love to talk about is access to nature in childhood and my guests' experiences of nature in, in early life. And I wonder if you could tell me about that for you. Yeah, for sure. So I grew up in the Caribbean. I'm West Indian. Um, And I, so my early childhood was in the tropics. And so now I live in Canada, which is not tropical. (laughs) Um, And I'll be honest, I cannot remember all that much, but I know there was a lot of outdoor play um, because, you know, no babysitters necessarily, so they just would pop you in the backyard and hope you don't get stung. I did get stung. Did you? I did. I was specifically told by my mother not to walk barefoot in the grass. And so I went and walked barefoot in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> and I was stung, and so I had to like limp back. And I was too embarrassed to admit that I had been stung. So I oh. like squeezed the stinger out of my foot by oh. myself <laughs> and waited until I could walk. And tried to pretend like nothing had happened <laughs> but I'm sure all mothers know they're like the child is limping yeah 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 <laughs> something has happened <laughs> so that I mean I lived I lived in a city um growing up but it was still not comparable to like the cities that I live in now mm-hmm. um and we had like a like a sandbox downstairs in our in our in our yard and I had one of my cousins who said her earliest memory of me is drawing pictures in that sandbox. Really? And I, I have zero recollection. So I'm like, I'm grateful for that, for, sh- for her sharing that memory. Yeah. And another part of my early childhood that would have involved nature. So I said that my family lived in the city, but we had extended family who lived in the countryside. And so we would go and visit them. And the children just all were like put outdoors to, to roam wild. Yeah. Um. So yeah, there was there was a lot of that in in my childhood, and then we moved to Canada, to Toronto, which is a very large concrete city, and a lot of that just I then I became a city girl. Mm-mm. Yeah. And so, by the sounds of it, from your cousin's recollection, art and creativity has been part of your life from the beginning. Tell me about that. How how you've taken creativity from from your beginnings? Yeah. No. Th- so. I'm I'm really glad that my cousin shared that with me because I don't have any recollection, right? I was just a kid. I just assumed it was a normal mm. thing. <laughs> um, so I I have drawings from when I was like a teenager and like a preteen. 
and you know they are exactly what you expect at that age for a regular regularly gifted child <laughs> so you know I'm obviously embarrassed to look back on them now but they were the best I did at that time and they were good for you know a 14 year old working for yeah. magazines um so you know I, I have these collections of drawings and actually I tend to forget about them and then some someone will eventually be like oh look I have this drawing you did when you were like 15 and a good friend of mine here in Canada her grandmother who we used to visit as as a teenagers has a box of my old drawings that I did really <laughs> when I visited and I had I had completely forgotten and she pulled it out one day and she was like look and I was like oh that's definitely me yes I remember drawing that now that you show it to me so I have I have this like brain fog of my own I can't remember so mm -hmm. well that other people pointed out to me where they're like oh yeah you did this here's this drawing of you that's beautiful that she recognized that that was something special that that was something to keep yeah yeah that was that was really special I think there were I teared up a little bit when when she yeah. showed me she's like oh I've saved these I was like oh my goodness that's like yeah 25 years so I was thinking back to when and where and how we found each other online and I remember it was on Instagram and I was considering doing the natural history illustration short course from <gasps> oh yeah Newcastle University and I was scrolling through the hashtag for that and I found you all beautiful drawings and that's how I that's how we found each other Thank you for reminding me. I was wondering, how did we find each other? <laughs> Tell me about that course and how that um, how that felt. Yeah, so that course was really wonderful. Um, I had I have done formal art school, so I'm, I'm one of those people who got, got the privilege okay. of going to art school for as post secondary, um, and then I had stepped away from art uh, into into the corporate world. Mm. And when I f wanted to find my way back, I felt that I needed some support. I needed, I needed something outside myself to help me, you know, find my way back. And again, with the short memory that I have, I don't know where I found that course. I must have been like doing Google searches or something. Um, and I found it and it was free because that's the thing that's important to me. <laughs> and so <laughs> I signed up for it because I was like, why not? This is, you know, this is free. It's virtual. You can more or less do it at your own pace. They, they suggest you try to go in a weekly cadence, but you could go faster or slower. Um, and that was super valuable because the, like the very first exercise is um, the pencil tones of your, of your pen different pencils. And I had forgotten, right? It'd been so long since I had done such yeah. a basic exercise that I was like, oh, yes, I do want to see the different marks that my my tools make. That's beautiful. I didn't know you went to art school. Tell me about your art school experiences. Yeah, sure. So I um, never considered art as a thing. It was just like a thing I did on the, just for fun. Yeah. Uh, when I was in high school, I ended up taking an art class just because I had an extra period to film. And that sort of changed my yeah. trajectory. Um, and then I only applied to art in post-secondary. So I applied to, in Toronto, we have several post-secondary institutions that uh, do art programs. And so I applied to those, got into all of them and took the one that I, I felt would, was most suitable for me. Um, and I chose illustration. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't fine art. It was... Um, illustration so it was communication and design I believe is the stream at that time and I specifically chose commercial illustration because I thought I get to draw pretty pictures and hopefully you know it's commercial <laughs> hopefully I can make a living from it yeah um so yeah that was four years of um training and it was it was really valuable I really appreciate it and I'm comfortable saying that like I was probably mid-range in terms of talent in, in my my cohort, I guess, that went through. There were a lot of people who, in my opinion, had far more skill and talent than I. And then there were a few who were maybe less strong. And I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, and, you know, we all, we all graduated at the same time and we were, we got along very well. And some of those people have carried on into illustration careers and a few have not. And I'm in between. <laughs> I have yes. definitely done a not art career, but I keep coming back to it. Yes. 
Yes. And you create under the name Jellyfish and Stone Studio, and I love this name, and I really am keen to hear the story of how you came to this. Yeah, sure. So um, it was, it started off quite literally. So I really love jellyfish. They are just beautiful and magnificent animals. <laughs> you know, that this is an alive thing that's pulsing through the ocean. Uh, and I also really love archaeology. So I have always had this intention that I would include archaeological illustrations in my in my current work. And of course, I haven't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> so that's where it started. But yeah. as I've as I've sat with this name, there's even more to it that really resonates with me. And it's the like contradiction in each of these things. Interesting. So like a jellyfish is this extremely fragile being while also being lethal enough to kill an adult, right? So that contradiction of like, they're the most delicate beings and they could kill you. Yeah. And then the idea of stone, which we think of as this permanent monumental structure that absolutely erodes through raindrops and soft breezes. Yes. And then the two together, right? Like yeah. a jellyfish and stone, the contradiction is, is um, I love it. That's magic. Oh, I love hearing about that. <laughs> so, yeah, w jellyfish, weird and wonderful ocean creatures are definitely your aesthetic, yes. right? <laughs> I love them, yes. <laughs> and you've created certain um, Instagram art challenges like jellies in July and your other one, Econoderms, in August. <laughs> yes, yes, I had, I had a good time that year. <laughs> Tell me about these. Yeah. Okay. So I am, um, when I decided I wanted to try, come back towards art and try science illustration, um, I was looking around for what, what I could try because there is so much, right? And I was like, eh, yeah. botanical art is not me. There are so many people who do that beautifully. That's not me. Um, and I looked around at wildlife illustration and a lot of wildlife illustration, and I'm going to say mainstream in air quotes because I don't know that it's true anymore. But at the time that I was looking around, it was all like charismatic megafauna. Mm -mm. So the beautiful, exciting animals that we think of. So in the ocean, you know, that's whales and sharks. Yes. And maybe pretty things like starfish and anemones. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. Those, those are well represented. That's nice. What else is there? Yes. And then I went digging and I found marine invertebrates and oh my god <laughs> <laughs> they it's a whole different world yeah. and they are they are fabulous in every sense of the word while being mysterious and surprising and almost like to me at the time they, they were like aliens because i was like this yeah. these things live on our planet yeah ours this these are earth beings so i was just like struck by these beautiful things and I wanted to draw them more. And I was looking for community, which is a theme I've found over the years. Like I keep looking for community. And so that's why I created something like Jellies in July. Because it's like other people do draw jellyfish. And so maybe I can pull them all together in one month. And just I get to see a lot of jellyfish. <laughs> right? And the same thing with like echinoderms in August. That was a really good time. I wasn't expecting to get a lot of like a lot of traction with echinoderms. But no. <laughs> They're out there and they're good. The, this is a fabulous, fabulous thing about the technology that we're using now because you can find the people who love what you love. Yeah. And whether that's jellyfish, whether that's echinoderms, whether it's whatever, nudibranchs, you know, yeah. there's <laughs> So I also did nudies in November, which I love um, it. unfortunately <laughs> there are other people who use that hashtag. Oh, in, the, in a different sense. In a different sense. So I, had, <laughs> I had to warn people when we got into the challenge. I was like, um, just so you know, if you check this hashtag, you are going to find more than sea slugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. That's funny. But I'm totally with you. Like some of these creatures are just completely otherworldly. And it's it's a thrill to know that they're here and that we can experience them in whatever way. And, again, it's technology that – because we may not be swimming around in the deep ocean, but yeah. we can, we can, um, you know, see photographs and videos, and it's it's really thrilling. Some of the photos and videos that you uh, showcased during your challenges were astonishing, aren't they? Right. 
And, you know, I had, I had a young, a young person. I want to say this person was maybe 14 or less, maybe 12. Um, I was doing an in-person show and I had my jellyfish paintings up and this person comes along and says, can I ask you a question? I'm like, sure. And they're like, you say these jellyfish live in the deep ocean. Well, how did you get this picture? <laughs> and I was like, that is such a good question. And then I explained, you know, the, the um, deep sea ROVs that go down and collect videos and collect samples. And then the smartest question then followed, but isn't it really dark down there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're like, they're thinking it through. And I was like, yes, it is extremely dark, but the ROVs have these bright lights. And so that they light up the animals that we see. And so the colors that we see, the colors of my paintings, I'm like, that's not really true yeah. in terms of that's not what you would see if you were without a light in the deep sea, but the white light of the ROV lights it up and they're just rainbows. Yeah. Oh, I remember seeing in the newspaper, there was a little pull out supplement in the newspaper when I was a kid and I can't remember how old, but maybe seven. And it was the first time I'd ever seen like an anglerfish and some of the oh, really yeah. crazy things that were down there. And I was like thrilled and shocked and horrified and excited at this all at the same time. And you really remember those things because that's what, that's what emotion is. That's what memory is. But I just remember seeing them for the first time and going, what? That exists on earth. Exactly. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. And like one of the most, one of the things that I love that I've learned by, by doing the research that I've done is um, that bioluminescence is the most, most common method of communication on our planet. Really? Yeah. So if you were an alien categorizing earth, you'd be like this planet bioluminescence. Wow. Right. And we don't think about it as, as yeah. being terrestrial animals. Mm -mm. All we got are fireflies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Isn't the world amazing? I just it, love it. There's, and it's endless. Like there's endless things to discover. And that's why I, that's why I love nature journaling because it helps mm -hmm. us get into that understanding that everything is fascinating and this whole world is fascinating. <laughs> and then you go like another step further when you're in the deep sea, just like, okay, what is going yeah. on? <laughs> yeah, because it's just something that we've not explored. We've barely explored it. There's so much more to find out about it. Yeah. So this month you're doing something called March Meet the Maker on Instagram. And this is yes. a little challenge that people do to show and share their art and get mm -hmm. to know each other as artists. And I already learned something about you, which was that you've been to the Galapagos. Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> Tell me uh, about that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to the Galapagos, oh, my goodness, uh, more than a decade ago now. And it was, I think, for somebody who loves nature, who loves animals and, and the unusual as well, mm -mm -mm. Um, that was like a pilgrimage. Yeah. I think like I'm, I'm not a religious person and so I don't understand pilgrimages that people make to religious sites, but I understand the concept now that I've been to the Galapagos because I'm like, oh, this was like a pilgrimage for me wow. because there was so much to learn there and it is, it is so unusual, right? It's, it's like reptiles more so than you know, cute, fluffy mammals. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you've got the finches, everybody's looking for the finches, but they're actually, they're not very beautiful to look at, right? They're just these little brown birds, but these are Darwin's finches. Yes. So the, um, the experience of going and, and seeing firsthand what endemic means. Yeah. Right. And seeing how these populations differ from island to island, because when you go, they take you as a tourist and they take you to all the different islands. Okay. And you get to meet the different tortoises that live on specific islands. Wow. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't know how to scuba dive, but we did a lot of snorkeling. So we got to like hang out with sea turtles in the water and the marine iguanas. Not so much in the water, but on land, we would certainly, they're, they're like animals in the Galapagos are fearless. They don't, they're so well protected that they don't worry about mm. you. They're just like, oh, another one, whatever. <laughs> and they just continue doing their thing which is mostly laying around basking <laughs> yeah it was it was a really glorious trip and if there's anyone listening who's thinking about going and isn't sure yeah. if they should go I go <laughs> if you yeah. if you can if it is reasonable for you to be able to afford to go 
girl. Yeah. And there's a picture of you. There's a couple on that on that post that you made, one with a giant um, t- tortoise, turtle. Yes. Tortoise. Tortoise. Um, and another one of you field sketching the, the iguanas. And, yeah, I'm wondering about field sketching and how that – what that experience was like, field sketching in that place of all places. Yeah. So to be to be really transparent, the one with the iguanas, um, that was not from the Galapagos. That was more okay. recent. And those were regular okay. sized little itty bitty guys. Okay. Uh, they were quite feisty though. Uh, but I <laughs> did do I did do some field sketching in the Galapagos. I do have pictures of that that I didn't include. Um it was, as I recall, it was quite difficult to do because the days are so full. And they're mm-hmm. also exciting. And because this is a tourist thing, you, you go around in a group. And so there's, an, like, there's a schedule that you've got to follow, you know, go here, then go here, and you spend an hour here. And you, so it's, it's, it's quite tight. It doesn't allow for sitting and spending an hour, right, you know, with something. Yes. It's, it's just take a picture, draw it later. Um, so I did have a few chances um, when we would come back for the day in, like, you have two hours before dinner or something like that. So mm-hmm. that's when I would take those opportunities to go and and do sketching. And it was, I would say, I think it was largely marine iguanas because they hold still. <laughs> they just lay <laughs> there. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> it was it was really beautiful to do. And I want to say I was extremely distracted the whole time. Yeah. So I didn't necessarily do very much of it. And when I would do it, it would just be, Often it would be the page, the pen. The pen is on the page, but I'm looking at the iguana and my hand's not moving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just staring at this beautiful animal. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a beautiful experience, but I want to say, yeah, I, I ended up being quite distracted and, and not necessarily able to focus on them. Mm-mm-mm. I have lots of pictures, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That just sounds so magical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so talking about field sketching, a couple of years ago, you were asked to give a presentation on natural science illustration, and you took a u- university group of university students sketching. In oh a my goodness! How did you dig that up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I remember it because when I was um, first engaged with your work, mm-hmm. I remember seeing your blog post about that. And oh, yeah. so when when I was going to interview you, I thought, "Oh, I want to mm-hmm. ask Elisa about that." <laughs> yeah, that you know that was really fun. I got to do it two years in a row, um, and the person who invited me to do it was a PhD student who was teaching at York University, which is one of the primary uh, post-secondary institutions here. Um, and she wanted to include field sketching mm-hmm. in her. I think it was a biology class she was teaching because she's like they need to be able to go out and look at something and record it. Yeah. Um, and so I, she con- got in touch with me and asked me to, to do this. And I was like, yes, I would love to, because my corporate job was teaching. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, my other career, I guess, is um, learning and development for professionals. And I was like, fantastic. I get to like combine these two things yes. that I enjoy. And so I built a workshop for it. And I like taught these university students. We would do, you know, a block of time in the classroom and, get them to loosen up with like scribbles and so my very first like the very first thing we did together I was like turn to a new page whatever it is you're using new page get your pen or your pencil whatever you're using I just want you to scribble all over this page yes (laughs) and it was so hard for most of them they just they were just like I I can't I haven't done that for 35 years (laughs) and it's been it's been like not beaten that's not the right word but it's it, it's been discouraged right you're not supposed yes, to scribble all exactly. over pages yeah you get in trouble when you're a kid for scribbling <laughs> i was like no you scribble okay good turn the page I over keep it. scribbling i love it and did how did they respond once you kept on encouraging them did they relax into it um to a degree yes as far as you can get people who are very uncomfortable with the idea to relax into it <laughs> So we scribbled several pages and then we started drawing like circles and ovals, you know, shapes that would lead into drawing leaves and plants. Uh, And then we did, so I I really, I really did enjoy this. So, you know, we did the scribbling, we did simple shapes, and then I would take a very simple plant and put the picture up 
and explain how to draw this super simple leaf. Yes. Uh, and then they would try it. And one of my favorite things is some of them would start in the upper left-hand corner of their page and they would draw the thing that I was asking them to draw and they would draw it about one inch square. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is so good. Fantastic. Do it again, but start in the middle. Yes. <laughs> Take the whole page. Yes. Uh, so we practiced a little bit in the classroom and then there was a greenhouse on campus. So then we all got bundled up in our winter coats because this is January. And we trudged over to the greenhouse through a snowstorm. And then there's nowhere to hang your coat in the greenhouse. So there was this, there was wonderful little like musical chairs where everyone's looking for a place to put their coat down that isn't wet. <laughs> because there's all this humidity in the greenhouse. And of course, there's yes. dripping and the floors are wet. Um, anyway, so then we were in this beautiful greenhouse that had a lot of... Um, a lot of very variable tropical plants, including a number of palms. And there are a few people who decided they wanted to draw palms. And in my mind, I was like, oh, my God, that's insane. But good for you, buddy. Let's go. Let's look at the shapes <laughs> in that palm tree. I'm glad you chose it. <laughs> um, and so I also sort of gave them like a handout with like common terms when you're describing a plant. So like the different words for describing the edges, the serrated edges of the plant mm -hmm. or the shape of the leaves. Um, and so they had that and I was like, okay, pick your plant and start describing it, draw a diagram and start labeling it. And uh, it was delightful. Yeah. I want to say like a good mm, 80, 85% of them like got right into it and would come over and they would be like, is this the right shape of this leaf? And I was like, maybe. Let's see your handout. What do you think? <laughs> and then they'd look it up on the handout and they'd be like, oh, it's this one. Okay. And then they would like scratch it out and relabel it. It was so, it was so satisfying. I, I should yeah. maybe do more of that. Yeah. And what was the, when was the, your first experience of this field sketching, nature journaling sort of Ooh. way of being creative? Um, mm -hmm. Probably. So I would say that I have been doing it without knowing what it was, without mm -hmm. having a name for it mm -hmm. um, for a long time. So here in, in Toronto, in Canada, our summertime hobby is to go north to the cottage. And now I don't have a cottage, but I have friends. And so, you know, everybody goes up a weekend or two in the summer and you'd just be sitting next to a lake for you know an entire afternoon and so I would take that opportunity to maybe to do to do field journal field journaling field mm -hmm. sketching mm -hmm. nature journaling uh, of what I was seeing so lake shores hanging baskets islands out in the lake um, and then recently uh, my partner and his family do annual canoe trips where they mm -hmm. take off for a week or two with everything they need in a canoe and just paddle off into the wild uh, it's not that wild. It is an established trail. <laughs> We're not taking that level of risk. And so I do it there as well. So I always have my paints with me. And um, he's got a couple of, of pictures that he snapped of me out uh, sitting on the floor, sitting on the ground, drawing um, whatever I was drawing. I was drawing trees. And I'm always surprised by those because I'm not paying attention. I'm paying attention to a tree. Yeah. And then I'll sneak up. I'll be like, oh, look, look at you. It's you. You're drawing. Yes. Oh, yeah, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah how special that um our our loved ones our partners whoever it is friends can sometimes hold a mirror up and say hey you are you are this person you know you're a yeah you're an outdoors sketching wonder artist <laughs> oh do you know what that that does remind me and I would love to share this story with you um so on one of these canoe trips um there's a core group of us who go and, and then sometimes, you know, different people come along. And this one young man was with us on one trip and I was painting like a pine tree at sunset. So it was a very like backlit dramatic silhouette kind of a kind of a thing. And I was having a good time with it. And he came by and he sort of squatted down next to me and, and looked into my watercolor pad. And then he like looked at me and he said, thank you for making that. Oh, Right? And I was just like, oh. I'm speechless. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I, I teared up at the time. I'm tearing up again. Yeah. Because what a compliment, right? It's not even 
that's a beautiful tree. It's just, yeah, I'm so glad you made that. What an amazing thing to say. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. That just like rendered me speechless for a moment. That was really <laughs> special. <laughs> It was, wow! Yeah. yeah, because you are creating, be- creating beauty, or yeah. capturing it on a page, and uh, witnessing something, and then making something beautiful, and that's that's something really amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, my partner, and I have these discussions quite often about what is art and what isn't art, and who gets yeah. to decide. And of course, yeah. it's always inconclusive, right? There's no answer to that question. Um, but one of the things that I sort of settled on is the idea that art is something that you make that wasn't there before. Yes. And you specifically made it your art. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Sometimes I feel like the whole of life can be an art piece. It depends on your, it depends on your mindset. And sometimes, and I had this feeling when I was really, when I was young, like, in teenage years I really wanted to be an artist and I had this feeling like your steps can be an art piece your you, you know the way you do anything can be an art piece if you're in if you're in that creative space and I like yeah. that idea that that we are making our lives and therefore making something that didn't exist before yeah, I like that very much. And and my goodness, teenage you had a lot more knowledge than I did. <laughs> I didn't come to that idea until until much later, like maybe my late thirties, where I was like, wait a minute. It is possible to say that our lives are works of art. Yeah. Yeah. And, We're constantly creating. Yeah. One thing that we've discussed quite a lot in as just as friends, our interactions as friends is the inner critic. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that the inner critic for you is is a big thing and you've told me that you feel like the this word inner critic is actually a euphemism because it's not it's not so much a critic as as an awful monster bully yeah. Yeah. creature. <laughs> yeah. Tell me yes. tell me more. <laughs> sure. Yes, I do think I do think critic is a is a euphemism. Well, it, it does... sounds very it's, it sounds kind of classy, doesn't it? I've yeah. Been, oh yes, I have an art critic in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an art critic. It is a monster. <laughs> yeah. I um. So I I have a, a very strong inner monster. Um. I don't know that I can claim I have an especially strong one. I think I think we all have terrible yeah. monsters in our minds. Um. And. It took me a really long time to identify and to be able to, I don't want to say separate it from me because it is me. I can't separate myself from myself. Um, But to recognize this aspect of me and say, hey, you're lying. Yes. That's that's not true. And that was mean. Stop it. (laughs) You know, to have that kind of a conversation with this part of myself Um, and you know, I've had a lot of help to get there. So I have, you know, I've had a therapist for mm, many years. I have done a lot of reading in, I'm going to use air quotes again, the self-help space, because Mm -hmm. I think that we trivialize, trivialize it, but there is a lot of value there in lots of different formats. So I think that the reading that I've done, I come, I come up with the same messages over and over but all of the different people who say them, say them differently. So that the value in that is that multiple people can receive receive them. So yes. if, I, if I don't yes. receive it from author A, I'll receive it from author B. Yes. But the message is consistent. And it's, you know, the message is about believing in yourself and, and understanding that you have inherent value. Right? I don't need to make pretty art in order to be an artist. Yes. In fact, based on our discussion, I don't need to do anything to be an artist. I, I just create yes. my life and I am an artist. You know, it doesn't have to be drawing, painting, writing, dancing, um, anything. Um, so the inner critic, which I'd shared with you, I painted it one day. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you externalize this awful monster and wow. Yeah, and I was really felt very privileged that you shared the photo of this monster and my goodness, and I actually showed <laughs> I showed this um, painting that you shared with me to 
uh, my son and my niece and both of them like scream literally scream <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> but he is terrible it's a terrible no. monster yeah so the monster i'm look i actually have a photo the photo you sent me right here and oh, wonderful. you've you've created this humanish but grotesque creature that has a rounded sort of swollen back and sharp teeth and hands that are wizened and it's incredible i love it and i'd love to hear more about that process of externalizing mm. this and how that made you feel um so it was a very intuitive process i will say it um it was i cannot recall the reason why i decided to externalize it i suspect it was an exercise that i had acquired somewhere someone said externalize mm -hmm. your critic and I was like why not let's try it yeah um, and so I just the way that I do that that intuitive externalization is to sit and think and visualize in my mind so what is this thing I'm feeling and how does it look what you know what colors might it be what shape might it be um and so when I put him down into that sketchbook I didn't necessarily have a solid plan. It was just coming as I thought about it. Yeah. Uh, and that was the creature that came up with that, like, he looks a little, a little sneaky. He looks a little, yes. like, like a little, he's just going to like get under your skin kind of a thing. Yes. Um, and once I had drawn it out, painting was the next step. And it was the same process whereby I was like, I'm not really sure, you know, what colors it should be. And I just sort of started mixing and, picked up whatever was in the palette and started and then it, I have it just behind me he's um he's like a greenish color with with yeah. greeny brown shadows those are technical terms greeny brown <laughs> <laughs> um and you know when I was finished and I looked at it and I thought oh my goodness there you are yeah yeah you are unpleasant <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel some in some way lighter having done that or did you was it just a um, meeting some a familiar entity or what was the feeling behind it I'd say I did feel a little lighter and a thing that I appreciated once I was able to look at it was to say oh you're not all terrible you're kind of cute mm -hmm. look at your cute little hands <laughs> little claw feet who's got cute little claw feet <laughs> maybe you're kind of cute but you're still really mean, so you stay over here on this page and don't go back in my head. <laughs> yeah, amazing. What an amazing experience. And this idea, I mean, this this thing, it's so, it's so pervasive. Everybody has this voice mm -hmm. and our con continuous, almost daily, I would say, uh, work as artists is to turn down the dial on that voice yeah. um it's not something that you can just say oh I'm done with it I've done oh, yeah. I've done my 20 years of therapy I'm done with yeah. it it's not yeah. like that is no. it <laughs> you're quite right not at all there is no off switch um what the exercise of externalizing it did was it really um deepened the practice of recognizing it right yes. of saying oh hey that's the critic or the monster, you know, we should maybe give it a name or something. Um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the monster. That's not real. Yeah. And so the practice of externalizing it helps with that to say, I had this thought and it's a mean thought. Therefore it's from this guy, this yes. guy over here. It's not mine. And amusingly to share with you another further story about, about that inner monster bully guy, um so the picture i sent you was just the painting and then afterwards i did a little bit of journaling around mm -hmm. around him because i was like why not mm -hmm. um and sure enough not like two or three sentences in he pipes up in my mind and he says you're a terrible writer oh wow and i'm look <laughs> i'm looking at him on the page and i'm like my friend my writing is not the most important thing on this page you are. <laughs> so you can you can shut it and I'm going to finish this thought, but it was just, wow. it was, it's amazing, right? As soon as you start doing something, it pops up and it's like, you're not good at this. It's like, um, no, you're lying. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting, like as, as 
friends or you know kind-hearted people moving through the world you would never not even entertain the thought of saying these things to someone else never no and to take that even one step further if somebody tried to say that to you beth and i would get on a plane (laughs) i'd be like don't (laughs) you dare talk to my friend like that no yeah and yet we say these things to ourselves every single day it's it doesn't make sense it does not no and i mean um another another tool in my toolkit is when when that inner critic is so loud and so convincing to me, I have a few people that I can go to and say, I'm feeling really terrible about myself right now. Can you please remind me why I am not a failure at life? And bless them, they do. Yes. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about that because we have spoken about a related thing, which is imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is sort of, come into the into general use lots of people talking about having and feeling imposter syndrome Uh, but it is related to this because again it's just another sort of form of this awful voice saying Mm -hmm. actually you're too big for your boots you're not (laughs) you know what you're doing back off (laughs) go watch some Netflix (laughs) and you told me that sometimes because I was having imposter syndrome and I was sort of venting to you and you said one of the things that help you is to make a list of reasons why you can't do something and then refute those things. And you said mm-hmm. it's especially helpful uh, when someone else refutes them. So yeah. I love that advice. I think that's really powerful. Yeah, yeah. I have done that. I still do that. I, I do a list of like, oh, I can't do this because no one's going to like this because people don't want to hear from me. And then I, yeah, I refute them and then I share them with others and they are like, um, yeah no, this isn't, take this off the table. This isn't even a thing for you to be concerned about. Just no, keep moving. Next one. I love that. And and you talked about finding community and I think it's really powerful when you find those people and for you, it might be Sven, your partner, or it might Mm be um, other creatives or I'm not sure who it is for you, but finding those people, um, they, they, they are the, the, the solid feeling when you're feeling a bit overwhelmed or yes and so and so I will then take that opportunity to talk about the accountability group yes because those are some of my people yeah um so uh when did I start this in q4 of 2021 Mm -hmm. well actually I guess technically in q3 of 2021 I was feeling particularly bleh right like (laughs) I couldn't I couldn't get my act together I didn't know what I wanted to do I didn't have the motivation to do nothing, anything. And I thought, gosh, I need help. I know I have the capability. I know I have the skill. I have the talent. I can do whatever the thing is, but I just need someone to help me, help me along the way. So very much, you know, um, to meet my own needs, I put out this call where I was like, hey, does anybody else need help getting through Q4 of 2021? Right. It's the end of the year. We all have projects that are lingering and sort of just sort of trailing off well now's the time let's let's do this together um and i got some really good responses some people who were very interested in joining in and so i have a small group that i facilitate that is a strong word we actually take turns facilitating sometimes because there's days where i'm like no i can't today (laughs) somebody else take a turn yeah um and so we meet once a week and we discuss our work. What did we do this week? What are we planning to do next week? Um, we also discuss, actually, we always start with wins, like what what went mm-hmm. well. So not just what did you do, but what went really well this week. And we also share our fears and our worries and what are obstacles for us. And I, I love that we all have the same ones, maybe on slightly different cycles, but they're all the same concerns yes. generally. So it's very common the, the challenges that we are struggling with are, are common between us and I'm certain across many other people. Yeah. Uh, and so that was, that was a bid for community and it was answered and it was very successful. You know, we did Q4 and we were all quite pleased with it. And then we decided we would keep going, I guess, quarter by quarter. So we're into Q1 and um, Q1 has been particularly difficult for all of us. I, I don't know, January was a terrible month for lots of people. 
Yes. COVID is not helping. Yes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's, that's my group. So we're trying to find ourselves a better name. And one of us is really good at, um, oh gosh, I can't think of it. Is it acronyms when you've got like the mm -hmm. letters? Yeah. The letters. Yep. Yeah. She's really good at acronyms. So she's come up with a couple and we haven't selected one yet, but the word SAS is, is up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, I love so, that. That sounds so, so supportive. It is. And I think that's, that's actually what's prim primarily come out of it is it's a supportive environment. So the point of the group is not to meet your goal. The point of the group is to offer you support and mm -hmm. grace because you're going to fall down, right? We're all going to fall down. We're all going to think we're complete failures at life, <laughs> you know, for very poor reasons. <laughs> and when that happens, it's really hard to pick up your projects and move forward. So it is so, so valuable to have a community of people who will be like, oh, you think you're a failure at life. Okay. I'm sorry that's happened today. Let me remind you yes. of all of the ways that you are a wonderful, marvelous human being. I love the word grace. I love that you use that. It's a, that's a beautiful way to describe falling down, getting up and just keep on going with the support of friends. And yeah, yeah that's beautiful. And I mean, we, in the same thread as, you know, the imposter syndrome and the inner bully, um, we're not good at giving ourselves grace, sort yes. of blanket across the human species. <laughs> yes. Uh, we fall down and we beat ourselves up. We would never kick somebody else when they were down. Yes, but we're happy to do it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, what is that in, in our evolution that has developed this ability to be mean to ourselves <laughs> if you want if you want to know what i what i've understood is that it is an evolutionary adaptation for us to um focus on the negative mm -mm. because it was better for survival yes so if i hear a stick a twig crack you know outside of the fire the circle of fire then something is wrong and i'd focus on that instead of on you know the lovely warmth of the fire Yes. Uh, so from what I have read and heard, it is, it is natural, it is normal, it is how we've evolved, but it is for us to change it. Yeah. So you have, I want to talk about this amazing project you've just completed. And so, okay, so some months ago, you committed to this huge artistic goal, your 100 paintings project. And first, I'd love for you to describe what your idea was and how you planned to execute it. And then we'll talk about what happened. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the hundred paintings project comes along. Um, now that we've had this conversation, I'm like, Oh, it's a thing because I couldn't bring myself to do something I wanted to do, which is paint every day. <laughs> I couldn't just sit down and paint every day. I needed something else to help me do that. So there's a theme. <laughs> um, and I, I found it in a book. There was another artist who did a hundred paintings project um, maybe like 10 years ago as well. So quite some time had passed since she had done it. And so I got the idea in a book and then I looked her up and like she had done a TED talk on it. And, you know, there was a lot of information about why she did it in the structure and you know, how it went for her. And I thought, gosh, why not? Um, a key point of it is external motivation, because the idea is you paint a single painting every day and you send it out by email mm -hmm. to, you know, whomever signed up for your list. And people get used to having an email from you every day. You skip one and you get it like, where's the painting? Where's, it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. where's my art? <laughs> so it's very effective external motivations that way. Yes. And beyond that, you get all of this positive feedback, which is somebody with self-doubt and imposter syndrome is so <laughs> valuable, right? You get people saying, oh, I really love today's painting or, you know, ah, I thought yesterday's was my favorite, but now it's today's. Yes. It's like, yeah, that's the positive feedback loop, which is really lovely. Um, so in terms of how I was going to execute it, um, I started with no mailing list. I hadn't it's not a thing I had done for myself yet. So I thought this is a great opportunity. So I built a mailing list and I emailed everybody I knew in all walks of life. 
and said, hey, do you want to be on my mailing list? I'm going to send you a painting every day. <laughs> and, you know, I, um, I no longer remember the exact uh, percentages, but a goodly number of people signed up to have my paintings. Uh, so I did that. And then I thought, OK, um, I'm going to plan this out. What am I going to paint? And Beth and I had no idea what I was going to paint. I was like, should I paint the jellyfish every day? Uh, should I paint a tree? Like, I don't know. I left it open. Um, and I'm really glad I did because what I ended up doing was emotional representation. Yes. So that same intuitive process that brought my inner bully out onto the page, I used that same process without necessarily realizing it until we've just had this conversation. Um, but I would sit at my drawing board every morning and say, hey, Lisa, how do you feel today? Yes. And so guess what? I have lots of feelings. <laughs> There are a hundred of them out in the world. Easily a hundred. <laughs> and, you know, if you'd asked me before, Lisa, could you paint your feelings for a hundred days? I would have said, yeah. that's, no, that's silly. No way. Yeah. But that's what it was. But you did it. And it mm -hmm. was amazing. And I loved seeing each one. It was a real treasure to open the emails every day. Oh, thank you. And to see what it was going to be. And some of them were so joyful. And some of them were really hard as well. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like it was just a showcase of beautiful emotions. It was it was both. It was it was everything. It was really a really wide um a really wide exploration of of feeling. And do you know what? Every so I I figured assumed let's use the word assumed I assumed the pretty ones the light ones the joyful ones I assumed those ones would would definitely be sold and then the like more difficult ones that tended to be darker and kind of grimier and heavier I didn't think those ones would sell and they absolutely did yeah um, I, I think yeah every dark and heavy one sold right away and, you know, I had to stop myself from asking people, why did you buy that? <laughs> <laughs> but that's so interesting because, again, you know, when you start communicating, when you have a group and you start discussing, everyone's going through so much. Everyone's yeah. got dark emotions. And so that makes total sense to that someone has actually put on paper what you're feeling. Of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so the... So what you actually did was you started selling them and they the price would go up yeah. for each day. So this is also super, super useful for somebody who struggles with imposter syndrome as an artist. So, and I, I, I can't take credit for it. The original artist, um, her name is Jolie Kerr. She came up with this, or if she mm -hmm. didn't, someone else before her. Um, but the idea is it's 100 days, one painting a day, and day one is $1, and day two is $2, and $3, and all the way up to 100 and what this does as an artist who struggles with pricing their work is that you don't yes. have to price your work. Yes. The price is already set and you lay it out at the start of the project. All of the people who could potentially buy it know what they're getting into. Yes. Um, and you don't have to discuss it, which is really helpful because it's so hard for a lot of people to price their work and to negotiate, right? To say, well, I believe this is, you know, $5,000 and have the buyer say, uh, two? 2000 you know <laughs> yeah, like yeah, go yeah. back and forth on on what that could be yeah um so that this particular structured project takes that out yeah and it also gives you the practice of selling every day right to receive money in exchange for your art even if it's five dollars it's still money in exchange for your art and if you didn't do it you weren't even going to get the five dollars and that can be such a hard feeling, can't it, as an artist to, to, to take say, money, yeah. to take money, to say, this is valuable and I'm going to give it to you for, in exchange for the money you earn through your own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really challenging. Yeah. So by doing this and having these small prices, like it's, it's very, um, it was not uncomfortable to send a painting to somebody for $5. Yeah. Whereas if I hadn't done the project and I had sold something, let's say at $100, I feel squicky about it, right? And I'm like, is it a, is it a hundred? Is that is that is right? That okay? Yeah. <laughs> should it should it be should it be seventy? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Again, that voice, the voice that says, "Are you serious? You're seriously gonna sell that for that much money?" <laughs> Just give it to them. Just give it to them. It's not worth anything. <laughs> 
Well, I'm so happy and grateful that I was part of your list. And I actually have my the two paintings that I bought from you. I have them right here. Oh my goodness. The first one, the first one I bought was, uh, it was number 11. And it was about getting older. Mm-hmm. And this is something that was really significant to me as I'm getting older. I'm have entered middle age and you know thinking about that and the changes in my body and so again when you externalized that for me of course that was natural I was gonna I was gonna buy that and and I love it it's very very joyful and and I try always to find the joy in getting older because it's a privilege a lot of people don't have that Mm -hmm. privilege to actually stay alive long enough to be an older person mm-hmm. um so i i find i try again it's it's a practice but it i try to find the joy in that so this painting means so much to me and my other one that i bought is called day sleep number 63 <laughs> <laughs> because as someone who works um is parenting in the day and working in the night sleep is rare and hard to find and this one I love so much and one of the most delicious things in life is a day sleep I know so So good (laughs) (laughs) so I feel just so happy that I uh, would have a little piece of your project because it was it's magical and I was I was really happy to be part of it in that way and to watch it unfold thank you so much I am so glad you were part of it too it was it was such a delight to to do that project. And, you know, I had a number of people be like, hey, you know, if you don't get through all 100, it's OK. Mm-mm-mm. And I appreciated that. Right. Like, you know, if you need if you need to stop, it's OK. Yeah. You, you're not you're not going to be a failure if you have to stop. And <laughs> I wondered myself, I'm like, am I going to get through this? Yeah. Am I going to stop? Um, I did have to take a break at one point in January because there were external responsibilities that just required so much of my time that it didn't happen, but Mm -hmm. that was fine. So I just sent an email that said, hey, everyone, I'm taking a break. I'll be back next week. And I did that and carried on. So, you know, it is fine. You can take a break. You don't have to power through. Yes. Yes. And uh, gratitude was the final piece. And um, I wonder if this was deliberate a deliberate choice because I know that gratitude for you is a really important daily part of life Mm -hmm. um it was not a deliberate choice and I can say that because none of these paintings were deliberate it was every day I was just like what intuitive what's going on what's going on today great let's paint that (laughs) let's let's paint that um (laughs) the way in which it was it could be considered deliberate is that as I approached um day 90 so I was in the you know the home stretch I thought Mm -hmm. well I I need, I would like to end this in a way that's meaningful to me. And so, you know, in that, in those last several days, yeah, it was, it was around day 90. So I had like 10 days ahead of me and I thought, okay, I made a list <laughs> because I make lists and I made, <laughs> I made a list of what I needed to, to get through the project. You know, what, mm-hmm. what were the things that helped me through when I wanted to give up? And I don't. I had. I ended up having a nice long list of like ten or eleven things, and then I, I looked at them and I said, okay, I'm just going to choose. I'm going to choose from this list, and these are going to be the last paintings. Um, and so, actually, in that in that way, I guess you could say it was intentional because I I looked at the list and I took I put that one for last mm-hmm. because I thought, yeah, this is how I want to end. I want to end by mm-hmm. by being so grateful for having done the project. Yeah, and being so grateful for all of the people who followed along, and gave me encouragement and positive feedback, and and like actually bought these paintings that you know yeah. under any other circumstance I just would not believe I could sell. Like I wouldn't exchange them for money. I would just give them because I'm like oh, I don't know art. I don't know. But you know now that I've done it, I'm like okay, I can price my art. Yes. Yeah. Did. Did this whole process of like starting and going through and achieving this huge project, did that in some way turn down the dial on that little monster or not so much? Um, Yes and no. So yes, during the project and certainly um, 
as it drew to a conclusion and then immediately afterwards and I was like holy crap I did the thing <laughs> you did it <laughs> I did it oh my goodness um I you know so then I had the, like oh I can do hard things I can make 100 paintings yes I can sell my paintings right so I had all of these counterpoints to the, the negative yeah. things um but it's not permanent yes right so some, some time has elapsed and it shows up again <laughs> right and certain things trigger it more than others and it yeah. comes back and it tells me I'm a failure and I'm like dude come on dude what are you doing <laughs> but I think the more things we put on that list the more we comebacks we have to yeah this this voice and when you when you have all those things and you can more easily remind yourself hey remember when I did the hundred paintings project and it was amazing yeah yeah exactly <laughs> I think it you're right I think it does help to have to have more things and in my case to remember that I did the things because one of I think one of my inner bullies tool tools is like to make me forget that I did the thing yeah interesting yeah uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you, but you've already answered it, is like because sometimes I ask my guests, is is creativity, is nature journaling in particular, um, a head activity or a heart activity? Mm -hmm. But I love the way you've you've just described this whole intuitive process of creativity. Where would you where would you put intuition between the head and the heart if you had to choose between those two categories? Where would you put it? Intuition is heart for me and nature journaling, in fact, for me is, is very much heart. And there's yeah. no, there's no, um, I always want to stress that there's no bias towards one or the other being the better way. But for me, um, I'm a heart person and yeah. um, when I'm out in nature, I, I feel, I feel stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And for I feel me, stuff. that just yes. yeah, I feel stuff, and it just comes through in on my page. And so for me, mm. um, that's what it's about. But I'm I'm so interested in that process of just sitting down and like tuning in, yeah, tuning inward and and yeah, feeling it out. And really interesting. So I had the span of time that I was doing this project in. You know, I had I had autumn here. I had winter. I had Christmas. Um, and I thought to myself when I started, I thought, okay, well, you know, if I run out of ideas, I can, I can do pumpkins and Christmas trees and, and little yeah. robins on snowy branches, you know, <laughs> do those things. Um, and I didn't, like, I, I just didn't run out of feelings. I just kept having yeah. feelings and I thought, okay, well, we'll just keep <laughs> going with this. Did you feel like you understood yourself better through the process? Um, oh, funny. If I have to give you a yes or no, I think I would say no. But okay. I don't have to give you a yes or no. <laughs> and so I don't think, I don't know that I agree with that. I want to say what the process of the way that I conducted this project, what it taught me was better communication with myself. Yeah, I love that. So in the, you know, in the process of sitting down every morning and saying what, tuning in, as you say, and what's saying, you know, what do I feel? What am I feeling today? And what does that look like? What colors is it? Are there, you know, are there lines? Are there blobs? What is it? Um, doing that every single day, yeah, does, it just opens the lines of communication. I am more conscious of what I'm feeling. And so to your question, do I understand myself better? I think for me, understanding is a head thing. Mm. And so that's why it doesn't immediately, I don't immediately go to be like, yes, I understand myself better, mm. but I just have a better communication. I have a better knowledge of how I'm feeling at any given time and that it's okay. Mm. So if I'm feeling frustrated, it's okay. If I'm feeling insecure, it's okay. And if I'm feeling joyful, it's okay. So having gone through, you know, 100 different feelings, they're all okay. Yes. And I think this is so important. And I'm really glad that you said that because we have this, again, this head tendency to say, to label things and say, oh, this is a negative emotion. Oh, this is a positive emotion. This is something I want. This is something I want to get rid of. And one really important, wonderful practice that we can do is acceptance of the things that come in. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and not holding them. 
so there's one of the paintings that is a technique I had learned called rain. Um, and I learned it from a Buddhist teacher because that is another interest of mine is meditation and, and um, Buddhist teachings. And rain stands, it's an acronym, got that word. So R is recognize. I is, no, so it's A, I can spell. R, <laughs> recognize, A, allow. I, investigate, and N, nurture. Mm. So I've got it somewhere in the middle of the 100 paintings because I was having a hard time. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I went back to that practice and I thought, well, this is going to be a painting. So the recognize is the like, oh, what is it? What am I feeling? Right. And so I get to practice that every single day mm -hmm. in yeah. order to do the project. And then allow is just, it's here. It's okay. Allow it to be here. And again, the uh, project is a practice in that, right? To allow it to be here. And then to investigate it and be like, what's really going on? I'm feeling really crappy today. Oh, this thing mm -hmm. happened two nights ago. And I'm still walking around with that. And then the last one, the N, so R-A-I-N, nurture, is that just take care of yourself mm -hmm. while it passes. Because mm -hmm. it, it will pass. You will feel a different way sooner or later. So until sooner or later shows up, get a blanket, get a nice cup of tea. And just be nice. Be nice to yourself. Yes. That's that's so important, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And again, with the grace, right? Like coming back to it. We just, grace. Yeah. We're not, we're not trained how to do that. So we have to retrain ourselves. Have you decided on your next big project? Oh, my goodness. What I want to try to do next is not exactly an art project, but it's art project adjacent, which mm -hmm. is that while I was doing the 100 paintings project, a lot of people, maybe not a lot, but a bunch of creative types were like, oh, I want to do that too. And so I want to help them do it because yeah. I went through it and I made it up as I went along, but I'm a person who likes things to be organized. So I have like all of these templates and spreadsheets for tracking and no, mostly tracking <laughs> for tracking and planning of like, you know, how are you going to do this? What's next? I have a template for the email. And so I have all of these things. And so I want to like help other people go through and do the same thing, because I think all of the things that I struggled with that led me to the project and all of the things that I learned from doing it are common across creatives, right? There's so yes. many of us that struggle with pricing our work. So many of us that struggle with a daily art practice. God, it's so hard to paint every day when you don't have a specific reason, right? Yes. And do you struggle with that too? Or are you able of to like yeah. go out? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you just go outside and you're like, it's a flood. I'm just going to dip my, dish my brush in and paint. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's this, yeah, it's universal, I think. it's, And that's beautiful that you're thinking of guiding people through that. Yeah. I think the external motivation part is um, so valuable, especially when it is a, it's basically a sure thing, right? The people on your that you invite to be on your mailing list want to be there. They want to see yes. your art. They're not going to be like, wow, you suck. <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> the people who want to see your art are going to love it and are going to tell you how much they love it. And that, that is so valuable to battling our inner critic. Yes. Oh, I can't wait to see what's next. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. It's been it's been amazing to hear your stories and to dive into these inner things. You know, there's there's this whole world inside and it's really fun to talk with someone and swim around in, in our hearts for a while. <laughs> oh, I thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to have talked with you and, and shared shared all this stuff with you. I a lot of it I hadn't thought of on my own. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Elisa. I really loved talking about all these important subjects like creating from intuition, externalizing the inner critic, accepting and nurturing ourselves through periods when we're experiencing difficult emotions. Elisa's 100 Paintings project was a huge inspiration to me. Watching her bring this project to life and putting on paper a piece of herself 
an emotional response to something in her life that day. It was magic. I invite you to visit the show notes for this episode where you'll find links to Elisa's website and social media, as well as a link to a gallery page where you can see all of the 100 paintings together in chronological order. Please do take a look. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. <music>